a fabulous talk. And then after that, we will have um, a, a section where, uh, where we, we will have a sort of Q&A session. So um, take some time to think of your spiciest questions for Nikki so she can <laughs> be really thrown off. So, yeah. So I'll do the formal introductions here. So hello, my name is Naomi. I use she, her pronouns. I'm one of the outgoing Faith and Action Project workers here at Student Christian Movement. Um, and I'm delighted to invite you all here this evening to our one of our Theology Thursday sessions. Um, our Theology Thursday sessions at SCM are one of our great opportunities to invite interesting theologians and activists and thinkers in the religious space to share their ideas and to explore what their faith means to them in terms of different issues of social justice. I'm delighted this evening to invite Dr Nikki Burback, from, who is the Social and Environmental Justice Lead at the London Jesuit Centre, to talk to us this evening about trans liberation and the church today. So, welcome Nikki. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, hi everyone, it's amazing to be here. Um, I don't know if I saw many of you at the York St John conference a couple of weeks ago. I think I met Naomi there. But um, if not, it's wonderful to meet you as well. Uh, so, yeah, today I'm I'm going to be talking about trans liberation theology. And let me just see if I can figure out how to share this slideshow again. I am bad with teams and everything to do with it. So you should. <clears throat> you should be able to see my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Apparently there's a bit of a delay, but can hang on. It should be doing the presentation thing now. Hang on. Can you can you see my like PowerPoint thing? I think yes, it's lo loaded up now. Yes. OK, cool. Um, it's not actually going on to like the presentation. Oh, wait, there we are. OK, cool. So, yeah, um, I'm going to be talking about um, trans liberation theology and the church. I say the church in this broad way because I think that there are lots of kind of common things that we'll have encountered, regardless of our various like denominational identities, whatever. I'm going to be talking particularly about my own Roman Catholic church. Um, but I think that what I have to say might extend kind of beyond its boundaries. So kind of take the title of this talk as a sort of invitation to, you know, test out these ideas for yourself and kind of compare and contrast and stuff like that. Um, so today's question is really, um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about how people in the Roman Catholic Church um, think about transness, theologians. Um, I'm going to skip over this really quickly because I don't want to spend too much time on it. You'll probably all be very familiar with this stuff already anyway. I'll talk briefly about one of the problems with it. I'm not going to get into like the apologetic issue here. Uh, I think that those sorts of questions are dull um, and also, um, you know, you can find that stuff elsewhere. Um, I'm in fact my in my own research, I'm interested a lot in questions of like method, how we go about actually thinking about things, how our kind of theological frameworks shape um, <clears throat> the way, not just how we answer questions, but the way in which we approach the questions in the first place. And this is the kind of discussion I want to be doing today. Um, I'm then going to ask like how we as trans people, as trans theologians, you are all trans theologians if you're trans. Um, by virtue of the fact that you kind of think about theology. Um, and then I'm going to take trans liberation theology or look at trans liberation theology as an approach which might help us to avoid these kind of problems. I'm going to be looking at the trans liberation theology of uh, Roberto Che Espinosa as an example. They're here, which is terrifying, but um, <laughs> also kind of wonderful. So, um, yeah, let's just get on to it. So to really kind of understand the problem that I'm going to talk about, the first thing we need to do is have a sense of how people are kind of thinking about transness nowadays um, in or at least what I think of as the more kind of sophisticated approaches to transness um, that you kind of get. So if you were to read Transgender Studies Quarterly, the journal, for example, this is the sort of ideas that you might encounter in there. Um, most of people's understanding of what it is to be trans was formed in a medical context. So it came out of the practices in like sexology, 
in gender clinics and stuff from like the 1960s in particular um, through to the 1990s. Um, and this view saw transness as a kind of individual issue, right? It's a medical problem that individuals have or like a psychological issue that individuals have. Um, and this is kind of reflected in the ways of accounting for transness that came out of this. So like quite famously, this is one of the origins of the popular like born in the wrong body narrative or ideas of transness as a sort of an essence that you have. It's your secret like woman self inside your man's body or your secret man self inside your woman's body, that kind of thing. Um, you can see how this kind of ties into that because like you can construe that as a psychological issue you've got this like inner trans mental state um but you have this like external normal body and they need to somehow be brought into alignment with one another or whatever i'm not saying that's entirely wrong but one of the problems with this was that it became this very like totalizing framework everyone thought about transness like most, or at least most like influential intellectual people thought about transness primarily in this sort of way. And it means that they ended up missing out a lot about um, the realities of trans life, particularly its political realities, right? When you're trans, the only pro it's not the, like the main problem that you face is not necessarily your dysphoria. It's the fact that you'll struggle to have housing, you won't have much money, um, you might be alienated from the people around you, um, you're at risk of a variety of different health conditions that come with poverty, all of these sorts of things, the kind of political problems. And these were the kinds of things that um, trans studies, the discipline of like studying transness, um, which kind of emerged out of trans thought, particularly in the 1990s. These were the sorts of issues that that was really concerned with, taking a more kind of political view. Um, in fact, this is where the label trans itself comes from, as opposed to like transsexual, which is originally a medicalizing label. Trans is a, like more of an umbrella term, which crosses all sorts of people who would have fallen under the transsexual label, but um, also like would have brought been what people called like cross dressers back in those days as well. And um, some versions of sort of like lesbianism existed on the sort of borderlands as well, like stone butch lesbianism, you might have heard of that sort of thing. Um, but this way, of, this new way of thinking um, kind of changed the focus. Instead of being about negotiating personal like medical problems or whatever, um, it became more about focusing on the kinds of political issues faced by trans people, how trans people move through society, how they disrupt society, and how we might find kind of trans liberation amidst all of this. So this is how people have been thinking about transness in like a good way since the 1990s. It's quite old now, it's like 30 years old. Unsurprisingly, the Roman Catholic Church is a bit behind this. Um, no surprises there. Um, if you look at the way that Catholic theologians tend to think about transness, I found that they tend to fall into three sorts of broad categories. Um, and the first two kind of underpin the third. So the first of these is um, the kind that you get in um, bioethics. So philosophy talking about the ethics of various medical procedures or medical policies and stuff like that. It's focusing around questions of whether clinicians can do certain kinds of treatments. Um, it's in this regard, it kind of mirrors that early kind of medicalization of transness. It's concerned with the same sort of medical world that produced the idea of like transsexualism and things like that. Um, it focuses on transness basically as a kind of source of individual ethical problems faced by individual clinicians or of um, decisions that individuals who are in charge of medical institutions need to make. Um, and often you'll find that Catholic bioethicists also take a very medicalizing view of transness itself, um, reducing it to um, you know, a sense of dysphoria, which people respond to with certain medical treatments, or um, even just like slightly more insultingly, just like a straight up mental health issue. Um, so basically it views transness as a kind of problem it presents problems to individuals that individuals must respond to. The other version is like a kind of what well, I think is like the pastoral response. Um, the kind of pastoral approach sees transness as a problem, but not for clinicians, but kind of for priests. 
Um, so pastoral responses to transness, really think about how priests can fulfil their pastoral responsibility towards trans people. Um, Again, it's very individualising. The kinds of considerations that they take into account tend to be things like the trans person's individual suffering or um, the priest's individual attitudes towards trans people. Um, and often kind of the solutions to these problems when the response is like a positive one is to basically advocate for like seeing trans people as individuals, not letting their transness get in the way of you kind of responding to them, welcoming them. This is the sort of stuff that you get in like Pope Francis's um, kind of pastoral stuff all the time. If you read anything that he's ever said about like welcoming LGBT people, it tends to fall along these lines. The LGBTness shouldn't exclude them from the church. They're individuals in need of pastoral care. Um, a more negative approach sees transness itself as like a problem or an obstacle. So a more kind of con conservative commentator would say something like, um, you know, this trans person wants to join the church, but they can't fully participate unless they repent of their transness or are accompanied past their sin, which is causing them to be trans, basically. But again, it's a very kind of individualising approach. These are pastoral issues confronting individuals that then individual pastors have to help them through. And then these two kind of lead to the third approach, which you'll definitely be familiar with. This is like the kind of political response to transness. Um, so in fact, there are two kind of political responses to transness that you find in Catholic theology. Um, one is a more kind of liberationist approach that you get from like some feminist theologians. Um, for example, I'm working on an editor collection with a bioethicist, in fact, feminist um, bioethicist from the US called Lisa Sol Cowhill. And she takes a very different political approach to this one. But like the one which has become most kind of prominent, at least in like the public consciousness, I think, is a more negative approach. This is the kind of political approach that's embodied in like talk about like gender ideology or whatever. It sees transness as an expression of an individualistic kind of libertarian ideology that says we can just do whatever we want with nature. It's maybe imposed on indigenous societies or colonised societies as a form of imperialism, that kind of thing. Transness itself is kind of it's a threat, it's a danger. Um, and this is a problem in a different way, right? The problem with this is not that it's individualising, although it does claim that transness itself is like individualistic. So maybe there's kind of a link there. But, but it's a problem because it just reproduces trans oppression, right? If you have a society where everyone believes this stuff, it's going to be freaking horrible to be a trans person in it. Um, and the other two narratives kind of play into it in that they, they kind of support it, right? So the biomedical narrative, um, it gives you a sophisticated way of saying why transness is bad and why it should be associated with an ideology rather than like the truth of what it means to be a person. Um, and likewise, the pastoral one, you see this move in Pope Francis sometimes. There's a tension between um, the way that he has this supposedly positive pastoral outlook and then his worries about like gender theory. And, and it works by basically saying, well, I've got this nice pastoral outlook, so I'm fulfilling my pastoral responsibilities so I can then say all this like political stuff on the side. So how do we kind of get out of this like mess of bad narratives? How do we move beyond these kind of individualising narratives of transness that then play into these sorts of terrible politics? Um, well, this is where I think transgender liberation theology can be helpful. I'm guessing basically from, from my stereotypes about the student Christian movement, I guess actually, that most of you will have an idea of what liberation theology is. Um, if not, uh, here's a really reductive potted summary of it. Um, there's this idea in theology called the preferential option for the poor. This is that Christ came in the Gospels to the poor first and involved himself in their lives and with their concerns. Um, he's working in the lives of the poor and the oppressed, basically. So we've got to look to the lives of the poor and the oppressed to understand where Christ is working today still. Um, it also says that like oppressed people know Christ in his working in their lives in this way. So they have a kind of authority to 
go back to to do theology basically to revisit old sources like scripture and dogma and to interpret the world theologically in light of the knowledge of christ that comes from their experience of him working in their lives as the oppressed there are a billion different types of liberation theology um, all with a variety of like more or less ambivalent relationships to one another. Liberation theology often develops by people reacting against previous liberation theologians as they try to either incorporate perspectives which have been excluded or refine um, previous methods or previous outlooks or whatever. Um, so it will probably not surprise you to find out that there is such a thing as trans liberation theology. Um, it kind of had its heyday in the early 2000s, um, when, which kind of corresponded to kind of trans studies itself really getting off the ground. Um, in particular, you had um, Vanessa Sheridan and Virginia Ramey Mollencott. Um, Mollencott was quite a well-known feminist theologian before dipping um, toes into this stuff. Vanessa Sheridan was a trans woman from a conservative evangelical background who wrote a couple of books. Um, and they both drew from, including one with um, Mollencott, in fact, and you'll see a picture of it on the side of your screen there. Um, but they basically drew from feminist liberation theology and turned those sorts of ideas and approaches to um, the kind of gender liberation that you get in the context of trans lives rather than specifically women's lives. Um, and trans liberation theology kind of approaches trans people in a theological way, but in terms of the injustices that we face, the oppressions that we face, and it concerned itself with questions to do with injustice and oppression. I think that this is a good approach because basically it takes transness and looks at it theologically, but in this like non individualizing way. And it basically ties your approach to transness to a more progressive or rather liberationist kind of approach. Um, I want to explore this kind of in more detail, though, and um, I'll do this in reference to a more modern or more contemporary example of trans liberation theology or liberation theology at least that's concerned with trans stuff as you'll see later among many other things um and and that's kind of it's kind of interesting because there really haven't been a kind of consistent output of trans liberation theology right after this initial kind of upsurge in like the first couple of years of the 2000s uh sheridan quit christianity because um she found it horrific um and i don't blame her but um, Moncourt kind of retired and then died. Um, we've had a couple of books that have been kind of published, mostly um, like a basically like kind of like a couple of collections of people talking about their faith life as trans people and stuff. Um, but then you had a slight rise again, kind of corresponding to you know what Time Magazine famously um, called the trans tipping point in kind of 2014, I think that was. So kind of in the years kind of surrounding that kind of moment. Um, and hopefully we'll kind of continue to see it on the rise. And um, yeah, uh, Dr. Espinosa's work um, is kind of like a kind of cutting edge of this new kind of trans liberation theology moment. So um, I'm not going to do something really weird and talk about someone who's in my audience in the third person. Um, and I mean, <laughs> uh, Dr. Espinosa, if I get this wrong, please feel free to just like leap in and correct me. This is one one advantage of talking about someone who's in the audience is that they can actually stop you going horribly wrong. Um, but Roberto Che Espinosa, he they, um, is a masculine a center non-binary Latinx scholar. Um, they experienced uh, dynamics of race and sexism and wealth inequality um, growing up as a mixed race child in a kind of Southern Baptist um, environment in the US. Um, they became an ordained Baptist minister, but self-described as more Mennonite and Anabaptist than Southern Baptist. So a slightly different kind of like ideological strand perhaps within the church. Um, I have to admit I'm not super familiar with the distinctions between various Baptist kind of theologies, although I know that the Mennonite tradition has a really strong tradition of like pacifism. Um, dis they've 
produced, um, I can't remember his name now is, but there's like a really great Mennonite um, theologian who wrote this amazing prison abolition theology book, um, stuff like that. And you can kind of get that kind of sensibility in Espinosa's work as well. Um, they work at Duke Divinity School. Um, they're a public theologian with a really kind of prolific popular output. So there's tons of like blog articles and interviews and stuff like that. And um, their two main books kind of sit in this, I would say kind of like theological sweet spot actually, of stuff that manages to be both quite like deep, but also very like popular and accessible. And these two books are, so, so I highly recommend them first of all, um, but um, these two books are Activist Theology, published in 2019. And then this kind of whole project was developed a bit further in their more recent book, uh, Body Becoming a Path to Our Liberation, which was published last year. Um, and I'm going to talk about both of these two books as my examples. So activist theology emerged out of their experience during their ministerial training. Um, they experienced people basically kind of flourishing in all the spaces that theology, that traditional Christian theology would generally not lead you to expect to expect them to be flourishing in. Um, flourishing in what they describe as the indecent margins, a term drawn from Marcella Althaus works, uh, sorry, Marcella Althaus reads kind of um, landmark book of queer theology, indecent theology. The indecent is the kind of queer um, post-colonial aspects of society which are kind of suppressed under this label of indecency and sexual norms, they rule this out and then it kind of surges up as a form of kind of queer post-colonial resistance. Um, during this training as well, they experienced like really deep, meaningful connections across denominational boundaries and also had some profound experiences of like injustice. And altogether, these experiences shook their kind of theological certainties, imbuing them with what they describe as divine doubt. Um, another kind of landmark moment in this process was um, experience of radical evil in like Charlottesville. Uh, you remember one of the um, kind of huge sort of right wing protests where someone quite infamously crashed a car into the um, people on the side of the road in like this deliberate attack and killed, I think, several people. Um, and this experience of like the reality of evil and the imperative of justice that comes with it um, kind of fed into the sense that um, Theology needs to be activist. We need to make a change in the world. We need to respond to injustice. Um, and that this kind of imperative has a huge kind of urgency that requires basically a sort of reconfiguration of the way in which we approach theological questions in the first place. Um, the fact that many of these experiences challenge um, certainties means that we have to kind of set the question of certainty to the side and instead prioritize the question of seeking justice rather than trying to establish right belief and pretend certainty there rather than trying to create orthodoxies we instead need to focus on what liberation theologians would call orthopraxy or right practice achieving justice in the world and the rest will kind of follow after that um, they come from a Christian kind of cultural background and so look to Christianity for material for theologizing about these things. I have a number of sources, but um, one really kind of important one is the German theologian Jürgen Moltmann. Um, he's a very famous theologian from the mid 20th century, wrote on a whole load of topics. He's mostly famous for actually his Christology. So if you come across the idea of like God suffering with creation, one of the major sources for that sort of general idea is Jürgen Moltmann's kind of theology. Um, Moltmann, though, says a load of other stuff as well. And the thing which really influences Espinosa's work is the idea that theology um, kind of, it directs us all things in theology direct us towards eschatology, and particularly Christology, our knowledge of Christ, points us towards our knowledge of the kingdom, the fulfillment of history. Um, it orients us towards a kind of horizon, the horizon of the future. Um, and because the real question facing us for Espinosa is how to achieve justice, um, this means that 
theology, the, if, if we're going to seek a future, it's got to be the just one. Our praxis, our question of right action, needs to be a question of how to achieve a just future. And all the theology which points us towards this future, um, theological knowledge needs to point us towards the establishment of this justice in the kingdom. Um, and this creates a kind of project. It's a project of shaping our theological imagination, the kind of ideas we have, the kinds of visions of the future that we have, to direct us towards justice against imperialism and domination um, and against in particular the theologies which lead to these sorts of things. Um, and in this we've got to look in particular for points of what they describe as epistemological rupture. So basically points where ideas will break and transform and change to reorient us from a future of oppression and injustice to a future in which we can achieve justice. Body becoming builds on this by integrating the body into this. Uh, the book kind of opens with the recognition that not every body counts. Um, most of us in this group, I think, will be trans. Um, many of us will, well, I don't know, I didn't actually look at all of you. I'm a white person, but like people of colour or like black people or minoritized group, like racially minoritized groups, um, their bodies are not treated as counting in society. Refugees and asylum seekers, their bodies are not treated. I mean, you would have are not treated as counting. We're at the moment, we're in the middle of a really terrible kind of political situation where we're confronted with this fact all the time with a uh, government that's happy to let asylum seekers drown in the Mediterranean. Um, with a government that's happy to incarcerate asylum seekers on prison ships, um, with a government that's happy to incarcerate asylum seekers indefinitely in um, detention centres. Bodies are a site of injustice, they're a site of violence. Um, not everybody counts. And Espinosa describes this in the US context as part of a broader breakdown of what they call democracy. This is mobilising all our different bodies to form a functional kind of social body, getting us to all work and live alongside one another. They argue that this, um, th this, this emerges in part from an alienation with bodies in general in our society. Um, and it also uh, reproduces this alienation. So we live in a society where loads of people are traumatised and are given difficult relationships to their bodies. Every trans person in this audience will know this. Anyone in this audience who's like racially minoritised will know this. Anyone in the audience who is disabled and has a society that won't accommodate their impairments is, um, will be aware of this. Um, we are alienated from our bodies by a society that systematically devalues many of our bodies. Likewise, we come from a kind of theological and cultural context where the body is often devalued just in general. So for a long time, Christian theology saw the body as like where the sin is and thought that finding salvation meant getting away from the body. Espinosa argues that um, our alienation from our bodies stops us appreciating the significance of the stuff that happens to bodies, um, including the violence against the bodies that um, constitutes part of the breakdown of democracy. Um, but they also argue that if we can reconnect with our bodies, then we can truly appreciate the significance. And this can be the point of epistemological rupture, allowing us to recognise the evils of domination and also the possibility of the kinds of connections that we can find in our bodies, um, which can create a society without this domination. The solution is to reconnect with our bodies, um, a process that they describe as becoming re-embodied, which I quite like. Um, the reason why it will do this is, the reason why reconnecting with our bodies will do this is because they call it embodiment is becoming. So becoming is a term that they get from their work on the French philosopher Gilles Deleuze. Um, but in this context, what becoming really means is a combination of two things, motion and relationship or relationality. 
So our bodies are always in motion. We exist in time. We're growing and we're changing. Our bodies aren't fixed. They're not absolute. Um, they're constantly moving in this way, in space and in time. Our bodies are also in relationship with other bodies as well. To be a physical object is to come into physical relationship with other things, to come into physical relationship with other bodies. But even like in a more kind of in, in a more in a less like direct way, you know, we need food to eat. We need to nourish our bodies with food and that food needs to be produced sometimes from, for example, animal bodies, but also will be produced by people using their bodies. So when we nourish our bodies with certain foods, we're then relating to other people who produce that food with their bodies. And when we live in a society, when we live in society, um, we're living alongside other bodies, but also the institutions and the services and the structures and basically everything we have is produced from bodies and is always acting on bodies, even as we participate in it. Um, often in very unjust ways, in fact, as you know, you see with treatment of asylum seekers, we live in a society, our social body is one in which certain bodies do not count. We have a relationship with the bodies that don't count, even if we never specifically interact with them, even ourselves. So our bodies are always in relationship with other bodies. But this relationality is is also a good thing, right? It's not just a kind of negative relationships. They can also reconnect us with others. Um, so it can kind of mend the wounds of the social body, even as our own kind of the relationality of our bodies can also be a kind of site of injustice. And also the motion of our bodies, because part of it is like motion in time and because our bodies in their motion can transform, it kind of puts us in contact with the possibility of a different future and of changing the present. So reconnecting with our bodies in their relationships or in their relationality and in their motion kind of reconnects us with the possibility of relationships with others and with the possibility of social transformation. Um, yeah, so uh, the role that theology has to play in this is that um, well, so 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 one 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 of perhaps the striking things about Espinosa's work is that they don't talk a huge amount about the theological. I mean, maybe this is partly my own um, kind of theological predilections as a, for the most part, fairly like straight down the line kind of Catholic theologian in a British context, where um, you know when we do theology we kind of assume that we've got to constantly be talking about Jesus and Thomas Aquinas and stuff like that um, and if we focus too much on the kind of social analysis side of things um, at a certain point for some reason we believe that the theology kind of drops out. It's probably not actually a great attitude but um, basically we like stuff to be really explicit and we're kind of stupid like that. Um, most of the kind of theology in Espinosa's work, as I found it, really lies in the way that it orients us towards this kind of project of re-embodiment, right? God wants us to do this because what we know theologically is that there is this like horizon of justice that we ought to be oriented to. We see in the example of Christ's life that we should be achieving justice. So we have a kind of theological impetus to heal the social body in this way. Um, it's perhaps a little less clear um, how what role theology specifically is going to play in um, actively reconnecting us with our bodies rather than giving us the impetus to do it and maybe being something that we can use to like fight against bad theologies. But it's not so clear what role constructive theology plays. And this is actually where I'm kind of glad that you're in the audience um, because uh, maybe you can kind of correct me on this, um, though, which is not. Um, maybe it's actually more explicit than I'm making it out to be. Um, although I will talk in a moment about like some of the kind of more theological themes that uh, I found at least in your work. So it might be kind of different there. Um, there's also perhaps a strength in this approach in that um, they're very explicitly writing to into a context where there's lots of like religious oppression and religious domination and taking maybe a more kind of 
or, or less explicitly or heavy handedly theological approach to these things is like potentially a way of like avoiding more of that domination. You know, if you're writing to a queer audience about reconnecting with their bodies, there's going to be a large portion of them who really the last thing they want to hear about is like Jesus. So there's a kind of sensitivity there as well, which I think is maybe worth reflecting on. And it's perhaps one of the things that's distinctive about their liberation theology. And we might want to think about that later. But they do suggest a couple of like more kind of explicitly theological resources for doing this. So um, firstly, they talk approvingly of the language of theology and panentheon, panentheism. Um, this is kind of the idea that all of creation in some way kind of subsists in God's body. Uh, they describe this language as um, talking about God in motion and relationship is in all things and willing all things to come to life. And they also kind of compare this with the language and lens of animism in which all things are endowed with spirit and life. In this kind of view where, you know, God is in the motion and the relationship that's within creation driving it, to become embodied is therefore to kind of put yourself in relationship with the motion, the movement, the spirit, the life of becoming, um, as they phrase it. Or in short, to put oneself in relationship with God who moves the world in the kind of motion and the relationships that we find within it. So there's a kind of spirituality of becoming here, perhaps, wherein we can kind of contemplate God or relate to God in our relation to our own becoming. Anyway, so back to like the original problem with which I kind of opened this presentation. I see I've overrun by a couple of minutes, so I'll get through this really quickly and sorry about this, Naomi. Um, I talked about the idea that kind of common Catholic approaches to transness is kind of individualizing. Espinosa's theology is not an individualizing one at all, right? Trans bodies are figured within it as victims of a kind of breakdown of democracy and alongside others. So firstly, transness here is figured as um, the kind of locus of a political problem. Trans people are in need of liberation and it's kind of coalitional as well. They're in need of liberation alongside other people who are oppressed in ways that are analogous to their, the way that they're oppressed. Or in fact, are oppressed by things which are an expression of the same kind of fundamental problem. Um, transness is also, they, they, there's this wonderful passage in Body Becoming where they talk about a kind of ritual of um, taking testosterone shots and the way that it enters them into a kind of relationship with their own bodily becoming through transforming their body and interacting with their body in order to transform it. So transness in this kind of context is a site of political transformation. Um, and indeed it's kind of a source of insight. Like transness is a practice of, or being trans is a kind of practice of becoming. Um, and this again is a, it's actually, on, on the one hand, you could read this as a kind of individual piety kind of approach to transness, but it's also deeply political because it's about creating this kind of imagination that enables us to envisage um, less oppressive futures. So it orients us towards the political rather than being something which is just purely individual and purely internal. Um, and then finally, it cuts directly against the kind of terrible politics that these two individualizing approaches is, that um, are so common Catholic theology kind of underpins, because it detaches transness from the ideas of empire and denomination and domination that kind of bad Catholic political approaches to transness associate it with. Trans transness is not simply a vehicle for colonialism. It's not simply a destruction of valuable social norms or whatever. Um, it's not simply the result of power and domination. In fact, it reframes trans bodies quite truly, I think, as like victims of these things rather than the kind of tools of it. This is obviously not to say that 
you know, there, there are debates which people have about the way that trans as a label is imposed on um, various cultures to the exclusion of like traditional gender non-conforming, even that is a kind of imposition, um, kind of ways of living and stuff like that. So there's like an element to that there. And obviously you have things like pink washing and queer capitalism and stuff like that. So it's not to say that like transness is entirely innocent of these things, that no one is innocent of these things. But it does in general kind of reshift the emphasis or reshift those associations. Trans bodies are also victims of these dynamics rather than simply being like an expression of them. Um, transness isn't simply an expression of them or like a tool of it. So that's kind of the presentation. Um, yeah, I'm happy to talk about anything you like now. And I, I hope I didn't go through that too fast. Like I said, I didn't have time to uh, time it. So, but hopefully you all kind of got, <laughs> got the main bit of it. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, no, that, that was perfect. And we've got about 50 minutes now um, for a bit of a Q&A. Um, <clears throat> yes, I, gosh, I, I've so many thoughts here. So yes, everyone, I, I'd invite you if you'd like to, if you have any questions that you'd like to share, if you just um, use the raise hand uh, feature on Teams, or if you'd rather, for whatever reason, rather the conversation be on the and the comments, then feel free to um, just add them in the comments and then I can answer them for you. It looks like we've already got one. So Sorrel, if you'd like to go ahead. Um, this is more of a clarification question because I didn't do my research in advance. But when you say Catholic, are you meaning Roman Catholic or Catholic as in the, the as in like how Protestants use the word Catholic? Yeah, so I started off saying Roman Catholic and then lazily slipped into just saying Catholic. All oh, right, sorry. There I are obviously the other Catholic so churches. Sorry. No, no, there are, there are other Catholic churches and basically I don't want to deny the Catholicity mm -hmm. of other denominations, or at least I'm, I'm not significant, I'm not invested sufficiently in those debates to try and like wrangle who is Catholic and who isn't. Yeah, no, sorry, I've just been reading a lot of URC um, doctrinal stuff at the moment and they keep using the word Catholic in a completely different way, so I just wanted to check that. I got yeah. right. I thought you meant Roman Catholic, but I just wanted to check out. No, right Catholicity is one of those like super contested theological words because obviously, like when Roman Catholics say it, it's a branding exercise, right? In the same way that like the Eastern Orthodox Church like claim you're the, we're the Orthodox Church. Well, we're the Catholic Church. But um <laughs> <laughs> like Orthodoxy, um Catholicity is also super contested. Thank you. Oh yes, it looks like we got a, a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, thanks for that. Um, I guess it ties in with the Catholicity type thing. I was, we talked, you know, all the stuff about kind of bodies and, and how that works out. I was wondering about how you might bring um, some of that together with a more kind of Catholic theology to think about kind of ecclesiology and what, what if anything, this kind of thing might bring to kind of our reflections on the nature of of kind of church and assembly and the fuzziness of the edges of that when we're talking about the liberation of all things rather than the liberation of like specific things I don't know that's not as well constructed as it might be but I hope you kind of get where I'm going no no I think I think that's a really good question and it's the sort of thing that I have to think about every time I want to kind of reflect on this stuff um I think this question of embodiment is really profound in the Catholic context particularly the idea of a kind of social body um, in that in Catholicism, we see the church as quite literally the body of Christ, constituted as the body of Christ when everyone eats the literal body of Christ that you find on the altar. And then as this body of Christ, it can then put itself on the altar and sacrifice itself as a body in order to resurrect itself continuously every time we take the Eucharist. Um, and it's in terms of these images of embodiment or um, anamnesis, remembering the body, um, that we think of salvation and we think of the life of the church and history. And we really think even of like the goal of history, right? The Eucharist is supposed to be a foretaste of the kingdom of God. So in the kingdom of God, we will all be of one body in this way. Um, I often, I think in this regard then, um, Perhaps one of the ways in which we can think about this is that, um, you know, if we're called to 
uh, reconnect with our embodiment. Perhaps we can think about this as a call to reconnect with our Eucharistic embodiment as well. So to reconnect with our bodies is not simply to reconnect with ourselves as people in relationship with other people, but to kind of reconnect with a more fundamental reality that we are kind of one. And it's a oneness which admits all the kind of difference and stuff like that, which makes up the church. But um, in this way, I think it, it directs us towards a kind of interconnectedness um, and a kind and, and all of the stuff that follows from it. So like all the solidarity, for example, and all of the kind of ethical requirements which follow from that. Um, in, in a very kind, this kind of re-embodiment language directs us towards all of that in a very kind of strong and profound way. You know, if reconnecting with our bodies is reconnecting with the body of Christ, then we kind of find our obligations towards one another um, immediately when we start to kind of look towards our own bodies, because those bodies can't be understood except for as part of this one body. But I mean, you could spend an entire career working this stuff out, so. <laughs> Thank you. I also welcome just like comments. So like jump right on in. I'm not I'm not interested in just like, you know, banking all of my knowledge with you. You can also <laughs> produce it yourselves. I, I mean, just to, to um, piggyback off that point as well, I, I when you were saying that, I, I kept on thinking about how um, and I should say for the people in the audience who don't know is that I am I'm church finger, but very Catholic leaning. Um, so the Eucharist is the Eucharistic theology is something I think about a lot. Um, and actually, it's one of the big parts is following the Eucharist is obviously there's the blessing then that tells us to go out into the world. And if we believe that we're taking part of Christ's body within us, then ultimately that part, part of Christ then goes out into the world as we go out into the world and how we have those relationships mm -hmm. with each other as well. Kind of building on that, the the universal body in that sense, being beyond the church's world and beyond the the Eucharistic walls, like it, it kind of moves beyond that, you know. Um, I, I did also have a question, completely unrelated, um, but I was... Uh, throughout the talk, I was really struck by this idea of motion. I think you talked a lot about kind of the urgency, this kind of action. I think a lot of Espinosa's um, uh, theology, they kind of talk a lot about, you know, in the activist theology about the urgency of doing and um, and then in the, um, the, the second work you mentioned as well, the kind of um, how we reconnect with our bodies is kind of in motion and in relationship to other bodies. Um, which also made me think about how, as trans people, that I think oh, uh, people of any sort of um, marginalised group, there is a sense that you are both being that um, identity, so we, we are trans, we exist as being trans, but there's also a kind of doing aspect to that as well, right, you know, and I think we've touched on that as well, you know, for some people that might be, you know, um, medicalised transition or, you know, um, things like that, um, or, you know, just uh clothes choices or you know how they present themselves in the world and how they with their names and things like that and similarly i suppose liberation theology is also kind of a very doing thing as well very much focused around how we do i think it's kind of by taking the gospel and and sort of letting it translate into the world so i kind of wanted to hear more about what you think i suppose maybe more in practical terms what you think a trans liberation theology could look like maybe if if you maybe in a more um maybe in a more political way mm. um or what that that could look like within the church and outside of it sure so i mean i would say that i'm not actually a liberation theologian myself it's not quite the area that i work in even though i find it's really kind of what gets me up in the morning um and it's really what gets me going theologically speaking i've kind of gestured towards it but i read i've there's a paper of mine coming out in like really soon in Theology and Sexuality, where I talk about, so in Catholic Church or Roman Catholic Church, we've currently got a synod coming up and there's been this huge like synodal process 
in the run up to it, which is at least aspired to be a very kind of participatory process where the church gets everyone's voices involved and really comes to understand what people are thinking on the ground and where the church spirit might be leading the church in that regard. It's quite kind of groundbreaking in that this is not really the way the Catholic Church normally functions. It likes to pretend it's still like a medieval monarchy um, and has not always been as consultative in its history as it should be. But um, yeah, so in, but but I argue I argue in this paper that um, synodality, as at least some people in the church conceive of it, is a matter of inhabiting the body of Christ together, and that um, it's a ma it it can be understood as part of like the resurrection of that body, because people see it as a kind of Eucharistic process. The kind of synodal life of the church is like the Eucharistic life of the church. It's what it means to live in that body together. Um, and I argue that if you look at like the gospel narratives, one of the things that's resurrected in Christ's resurrection is truth. So Christ is crucified on the cross um, and is disbelieved and mocked. And all of the signs of his truth you know, his kingship, his authority, his divinity, they're like warped and parodied and used to mock him. So he's like put in a royal cloak when he's beaten and given like a reed scepter and he's crowned with thorns and he's crucified under a sign that says, here is the king of the Jews. Um, but then when he's resurrected, we see all of these signs transformed, right? When we see the cross now, we don't tend to think of it as like a humiliating death. When we see the crown of thorns, we don't tend to see it as a mockery of a king's crown. When we think of Christ's kingship, we don't think of it as like the joke that the Roman soldiers told while they tortured him. Um, all of these signs have been resurrected and come to mean something new. And his truth has been resurrected at the same time. Christ, when he was resurrected, was vindicated, basically. Um, and I think that maybe we can think of trans people's truths in the synodal life of the church in this way as well you know the synodal path shouldn't just be a matter of just like trans people being listened to in a kind of objectifying way or um being listened to according to the kinds of narratives that cis people have about us already that sort of thing instead we can see our truth as being resurrected in that and we should see this not all path as an occasion for the truths of trans life which have previously been silenced or erased to like come to the fore and be resurrected in the life of the church i don't know if that really counts as liberation theology it's got a sort of liberation theology vibe to it there's a sort of question of like epistemic injustice there as like mm. analytic philosophers would call it, um, injustice to do with how we think and how we know and what we're willing to grant credence to, that kind of thing. Um, I think in, 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 in a more political context, though, we're also seeing like one of the major themes in British trans politics at the moment is the right to um, relate to your body in certain ways. You know, if you're trans kids are being denied access to health care, specifically because it might involve changing their bodies. Trans adults health care will come under attack on this basis, I think, in the next few years as well. And we can kind of see the gradual pushing back of the cutoff point of when you're a kid and able to make these decisions. It's slowly expanding to encompass adults. You know, it used to be 18, that's 25, and God knows where it will end. Um, so I think like, Re being able to reconnect with our bodies and having a kind of impetus to do that, you could understand that as uh, as as um, being able to relate to our bodies in this kind of trans way as well. Um, mm. Obviously, there's an argument to be had about what constitutes proper relation to one's body, and this is exactly what's um, at stake in these kind of bioethical debates. You know, debates about whether you are in fact just mutilating your, whether or not you're just mutilating yourself when you take away your reproductive capacities, um, when you re-sculpt your body, that kind of thing. So I don't think it would be uncontroversial. I don't think it would be uncontroversial, but. Um, I could see trans liberation theologists talking about that as well. And then maybe there's also just stuff to do with the fact that like bodily life as a trans person is hard for non-specifically trans reasons. Like lots of trans people have eating disorders, for example, or um, just have poor nutrition because they're poor. 
or they have health problems because they live a really stressful life or just because they have health problems. A lot of trans people are disabled. Um, a lot of trans people are autistic as well. Um, and maybe some of these experiences of more like difficult embodiment lend themselves to then also having sort of a trans sense of self because you're out of joint with your body already. And I think that there's something kind of profound in that. You know, it's perhaps it's that point of epistemological rupture that leads you to the other ruptures. Um, but, you know, there are questions of relating to one's body there and what kinds of embodiment are valued. So, for example, um, you know, like in narratives around trans people and autism, um, autistic people are portrayed as having a poor self-conception, basically. And that's seen as devaluing their transness because it's not the product of like proper self-reflection. It's just the product of like people being weird and autistic. And like that's fucking terrible and also rooted in questions of like connecting with one's body. And again, like disability, like disabled bodies are not valued in our society and they are not properly accommodated in our society. And um, when people do trans stuff to their bodies, it's often portrayed in ways which are also ableist. You know, you're ruining your ability to reproduce. You're mutilating yourself and giving yourself long term health problems. You're making yourself an eternal patient dependent on like medical technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and also in the sense transness, some forms of medical transition can sort of be disabling in the sense that if I don't, if a doctor doesn't keep giving me hormones, I will develop osteoporosis and I will break all my bones and I will die. So like, yeah, I think it has a lot to speak of that sort of thing, to mm. that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um... Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think I think this is the final question, um, but we've had one in the chat that I think would be mm. a really lovely one to end on. Um, so this person said, your talk has resolved around the oppression and suffering of people and bodies and how that informs liberation theology. I have enjoyed interacting with trans theology, which also focuses on liberation by a trans joy and understanding transness as part of how God created us. So how do you weave the more joyful parts of being a trans person and Christian in with liberation theology? Well, transness is wildly joyful to me and it's wildly joyful to me because it is a liberation. Like, so one way of approaching kind of liberation theology has been to see Christ as bringing us liberation from all the things that stop us living our full humanity. Um, sin is something which um, damages us um, individually and as Lucy in the chat just said, as a group as well. Um, and I find actually that if I want to imagine the kind of liberation that Christ brings me from sin, thinking about the liberation that I found in my transness is a really good way of kind of connecting with that. And I think that in some ways, the fact that I've managed to be trans against the kind of weight of every social pressure is also like quite literally a liberation from the kind of sinful structures of our society. And I found that it's a liberation that's brought me into new forms of relationships with people. And it's given me a new sense of solidarity. I was talking to Naomi about this at that conference I mentioned previously, right? She said that um, trans women have a kind of sisterhood. Um, and, and it's kind of true. If I meet a trans woman, I may never really know another trans woman. I may never kind of know her. I may not know anything about her, but I feel a real sense of affinity and it will be a kind of ride or die thing. Um, <laughs> and this is actually the same with other trans people in general. Um, like, I may not know you, but I feel that there's a kind of real commonality between us, a real affinity between us. In, in a way, we are already part of like the same body. And I think that there's something really profound and maybe kind of even sacramental about that. Um, and it's profoundly joyful as well. And I think a liberation into a life in which we can live that out is a very great thing indeed. That, yeah, that collective joy, that's, I think, such a beautiful image and such a beautiful way to end the evening. Um, thank you, Nikki, so much. I think I will speak for all of us here where you've given us a lot to think about. Um, if people want to hear more about you or about your work or about what you do at the London Jesuit Centre, where would be the best place for them to track you down? So, um, so there are multiple ways you can track me down. Um, I'm on social media, mainly Twitter. Um, 
I have Facebook, but only really for the sake of having Messenger. So Twitter is the place to find me. Um, there's a link tree with everything that I've done on it, including um, where they exist, like access links to papers that I have that are otherwise behind paywalls. I think they should work anyway. I'm not sure. I've not ever got anyone to test it for me. Um, I also teach at the London Jesuit Centre. We're kind of like a small organisation that um, makes kind of spiritual training and also like theology accessible to a kind of wider audience of people other than people who are just studying theology in the universities. Um, and like we aim to be as accessible as possible. So like our courses have, I think at the moment they have like a nominal fee, but I think we might be getting rid of that at some point. Um, but like it's almost nothing to study one of our courses or attend our events and stuff like that. In fact, we've got some good ones coming up. Um, in fact, actually, I've got one coming up that I really want to run, but we need to get a critical mass of people. But I've got a load of people who like Christians who've been involved in direct action to come in and talk about the kind of experiences and theologies of direct action. It's called Faith on the Front Lines. So if you look at our website, it's um, londonjesuit.org, I think it is. You can find a link to that and all sorts of other amazing things if you're interested in doing that. But um, yeah, so if you wanted to, <laughs> if you wanted to encounter me in a kind of more teaching, teaching vein, that would that would be the place to do it. Um, but otherwise, you know, I'm around. You might run into me. The trans theology world is very small, so <laughs> we find each other, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> Well, great. Thank you again so much, Nikki. And for anyone who um, would like to hear more about the student Christian movement and the kind of work that we do creating um, a more progressive Christian future, um, you can find out more on our website at movement.org.uk. Um, so all that leaves me to say is thank you all so much for coming and hope you have a lovely rest of your evenings. Thanks for coming. <laughs>